Welcome to this panel, which is uh, around middle skills jobs um, and the future. We'll kind of see if we can kind of look ahead a little bit. Perhaps we'll start looking back uh, uh, some. Uh, and, um, and also, we have a great panel here uh, coming from various angles. And I think we can uh, figure out um, how we want to kind of slice and dice this space. Um, and we'll go from there. We're not doing elaborate introductions. I'm just going to quickly go through the names so that you know who's who. Here on the panel, you can A, reference uh, their backgrounds, our backgrounds, um, uh, in the book, if you have it, uh, on the agenda. And uh, one of the answers, through the answers, they'll weave their introductions and what is relevant to the topic at hand, if that makes sense. Thank you very much, everyone, for, uh, for joining me today. To my immediate left is James Homer. Uh, he's with Pearson's Accelerated. Um, after that is Kristen Sharp. Uh, she's with New America uh, and also involved with uh, Bloomberg's uh, Shift Labs uh, effort. Um, then we have Megan Barnes from AT&T's Aspire program and platform, uh, which um, uh, has m many things going for it, and she can explain some of that uh, as part of her, her, her answers or responses to things. Um, then we have uh, Jonathan Kastenbaum. Uh, he's with Tech Talent Labs, uh, a, a marketplace for tech acquisition. Um, and then uh, last uh, on the panel here is Derek Apinovich um, with Ultimate Medical Academy, a very specific online healthcare education institution. Um, I'll go right in, uh, everyone here. So, you know, as I was traveling here, I ran into or I picked up the um, Center for Foreign Relations report on uh, uh, what they call the work ahead. Interestingly, I was somewhat perplexed that the Center for Foreign Relations was doing this research and report. Um, but the topic is the work ahead, machines, skills, and US leadership in the 21st century. And I thought it was uh, very interesting how relevant uh, a, a lot of the points that it summarized were, were um, in how the U.S. innovation economy uh, had to exploit uh, the promise of new technology, um, need to rebuild links between work opportunity and economic security, uh, why that is a national security issue, and also an issue that the G20 across the globe should have to um, consider because there are interdependencies between geographies as well, not just in the U.S. Um, and then how that translates for us to um, accessible education options. Um, how do you address displaced workers, uh, augmented intelligence, the gig economy, on and on. It's a fantastic 162-page report. If you haven't got to it yet, you should try and chew through that. I've just started, so uh, it's going to take a while. Uh, but one statistic there that struck me for, that is very, you know, kind of hit really hard was we are, the US, still the second <coughs> to last in reskilling our workers. Only Mexico is below us in the developed economies. Uh, just a, a statistic that we, I'm going to start with, and then as I post my first question um, out to um, the panel. So I, I'd like for a definition of the middle skills jobs to, to be established. I know there is a very simplistic definition around um, jobs that require skills. That, skills that require more than a higher education but not quite a degree is basically what the technical definition of that is. But um, with your background, A, if you can kind of weave in your perspective on how you view, A, what middle skill jobs is, and B, if you can, if, uh, you know, position relative to other skills, why it is, it is imperative for us to focus on middle skill jobs especially as we look ahead into the innovation economy. Who wants to start first? Kristen, do you want to go? Sure. Uh, thank you for the great introduction. And, and thanks, everybody, for uh, attending the panel of the last day and the last hour of the, uh, of the session. We really appreciate your intrepid attention to detail. Um, so I run the Shift Labs, uh, which is a joint partnership of New America and Bloomberg, which is looking at how automation and artificial intelligence are changing the future of work for workers. Um, we look at partnerships between employers, employees, 
workers, advocates, CEOs, and and try to get a perspective across the um, across sectors and how we can create a sense of community vibrancy and how to create. Um, opportunities for workers in different ways than we have right now. Um, when I think of uh, when I think of the definition of the middle skilled worker, or or the one that comes up most in my work, it has to do with jobs and and ways to earn income that are non traditional jobs that get people to a middle class lifestyle. And it's it isn't just a type of work. It isn't just a you know working with your hands, having a certain level of education. It's having a pathway and a vision into something that is is a lifestyle that people that can support a family and that that give workers a sense of of purpose and um, sort of success in their jobs. And I think that one of the things that comes up over and over again in talking to communities across the country is that we, because because technology and advanced technology um, platforms are changing the entry points into the workforce so much, nobody knows exactly what that looks like right now. And we have we have sort of lost the clear, you know, work really hard, buy a house, send your kids to college, this is the pathway into the American dream. Any kind of job can do that, and we need to redefine those um, with jobs that will continue to be here um, in the face of technology. So Derek, I'll go back to you, go to you next. Uh, you're obviously in a very specific vertical in, in healthcare. Can you uh, can you see, give us the lens through through your lens as to what how you would define this, what you would look for, and why is it imperative that middle skills jobs have to be discussed and um, and trended? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm the president of Ultimate Medical Academy. Uh, we're in a national uh, online allied health. Uh, institution. So we just focus on those um, programs that you can teach effectively online. So they're more administrative uh, type programs. And we often look at middle skills jobs as those jobs that pay, say, at least $15 or more. Uh, and that range can be fairly wide. Uh, you know, the lower end of that range could be medical billing and coding jobs. The upper end of that middle skills range could be uh, respiratory therapists or surgical technician type jobs, um, but below nursing um, jobs. And then at the very bottom of that scale would be personal care aides, home health aides. So we're often serving um, students at the bottom end of that scale who want to move up to the middle skill range. Mm. So uh, many of our students have some health care experience um, as a personal care aide or a home health aide. So they've been around uh, the health care uh, workplace. Uh, they know the different components of it, and they're looking uh, to improve uh, their earning potential, uh, their working conditions, uh, their upward mobility. So that's a big part of the uh, demographic that we serve uh, in healthcare, moving up to that middle skill level. Sounds good, Jonathan. I'll go to you. Just to, uh, we'll just gonna run the spectrum of perspectives. You know, you are uh, more in the talent acquisition space and tools that enable that um, for the enterprise. Can you give your perspective on how you would see this? And why is it imperative? Yeah, so I spend my days meeting with early stage uh, emerging talent acquisition technology companies and figuring out how we could arm both job seekers and large enterprise companies with the tools they need to hire the best people. And you know, when you think about uh, middle skill labor, um, based on the definition, these are generally folks that have a really tar hard time articulating their skill set to an organization. In some cases, they don't have a resume. And so from a technology perspective, it's really hard when you don't have a resume and a large organization has an applicant tracking system that only understands a resume to put these people through your process. And so um, you know, we're starting to see some new applicant tracking systems that don't just focus on, um, on the resume, but more importantly, some skill assessments. And I'm sure we'll get deeper into that as we continue the conversation. Um, and, and to answer the second part of your question, um, you know, as I, I strongly believe, and I'm seeing it even in the talent acquisition space, that as artificial intelligence makes its way into the, um, you know, into large corporations, uh, skills are going to need to change at, of these middle um, skill jobs, right? So, and so rapidly um, that these traditional, the traditional education system won't be able to serve them. Uh, so we have to figure out uh, really effective new ways to, uh, to train these folks. To, to have the right skills that we need for the new new jobs. Training in real time in many ways. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. 
So Megan and James, um, I know both of you ad address the corporate space in a very deliberate ways, in different ways. I know, uh, you know, Megan, through because you are within a corporation, a large company, AT and T, and James, I believe, through uh, Pearson's, uh, you know, you are accessing a lot of these corporations and solving some of their hard problems there. Can both of you take take your turns uh, in again explaining the same question? A defining your perspective on middle school middle skills jobs and be the imperative of needing to focus on it. Megan, you can go. Sure. So at t has been around for 140 <coughs> years. So invariably, what middle skills look like at at t has changed quite a bit in 140 years. And taking a step back, about 10 years ago, we launched at t Aspire, which is our signature philanthropic initiative focusing in on education. That was very pivotal to our chairman and CEO and still is. We've invested 400 million into that. And Aspire started off as really focusing in on the high school graduation rate domestically, right? Getting to 90%. We looked at college and career readiness and those on track to graduate indicators and caring adult mentors and we engaged our employees. And within these last 10 years, I would argue that at t as a company has changed more than the 130 years that preceded it, right? So we are now a totally different company. We are not a telecommunications company. We are technology, media, and telecom, and we are powering a network, and we have 250,000 employees. And so it's been interesting to also see how Aspire, our CSR initiative, has evolved in the 10 years as well. We we'll still very much care about the soft skills, and that's something that we can talk about a little bit later, and in preparing these opportunity youth or young adults underserved in high school to get into a post-secondary track. But what that looks like and how we are doing that, you know, via credentialing or internships or uh, different views of what we need to do to skill them has adjusted because we as a company and what we're looking for in our employees has conversely adjusted. James? So yeah, I spend at Pearson Accelerate, I spend a lot of time with employers and we focus on middle skills career pathways. So if you find yourself in a, in a given employer and you are in a middle skills job, what's the next step for you? So we spend a lot of time creating pathways with folks from HR, from operations, from benefits and all across corporations to, to really understand what kind of future skills are going to be needed uh, and then uh, concurrently what kind of pathways need to be developed to get those skills developed. Now, from a definition standpoint, I mean, companies look at middle skills jobs even today as a key imperative around business growth or capturing growth opportunities. Um, it, and, and they can be customer facing, they can be back office, they can be service jobs. Uh, but they require a certain level of soft skills, ability to you know, interact with fellow employees or customers. They have to have certain technical skills to you know, execute certain business functions. And they are, in many cases, for large companies, both in the tech sector and hospitality, the front lines to growth. So as hotel chains uh, have huge capital budgets to build new hotels, there's an army of people they need not only to staff them but to support them as well, and those are the jobs they're looking to fill. So, that that, from my opinion, is is why it's a really, really critical conversation to have, and it cuts across every industry segment as well. Indeed. So, because we deal with employees big and small. So, I'm going to pick up of what you just said about business outcomes in corporates and how they kind of rally around that to figure out what kind of investments they make in any of these spaces, including. Uh, talent. Um, so kind of a trends question because we're focusing on and kind of look ahead a little bit. Um, so employers have the opportunity to support these business outcomes. So a good example of, is Lyft, um, for example, recently uh, had a partnership with um, uh, Guild Education, I yep. believe, um, and specifically focused on their drivers and figuring out how they help them uh, kind of grow. just using that as a pattern. Um, I, you know, the question I have is basically, you know, um, Kristen, maybe you, you can start again simply because of your work in that space, I think, in the on-demand workforce space. Uh, can you just give, a, just give us a little bit of a sense of how you would think about, um, how would a corporation, a company, think about starting an initiative or a partnership like that, that, that can start the trend of, you know, uh, going back to what James basically said, which is uh, tying the incentive or the investments in 
training and reskilling and uh, you know identifying the the middle skills and pushing that in front of the employee um, as as becoming imperative for the company's strategy going ahead going forward. Yeah, so that's an interesting question because. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot in talking to communities and leaders about the types of jobs that are emerging going forward is that sometimes the, and often the defining characteristic of what kinds of jobs will be available in the future are that they're self-directed and self-motivated in some way. They're jobs that the worker, the individual, needs to take responsibility for in terms of finding the, the type of work they want to do, identifying the types of skills or training that will get them there, figuring out how to, to connect with those skills, um, identifying that they're good at those skills, and then proving that to an employer, potentially. Yeah. And that's a very hard thing for an employer or an employee and a worker to figure out how to do, since our system right now is not constructed around that kind of, um, that kind of sort of self-determined approach to work. Um, so I, I see a lot of times that companies will identify an emerging skill or thing that they have a they don't have enough workers in right now and will specifically design the curriculum f to to attract those workers while building into that curriculum a sense of adaptability and a sense of the worker being able to learn on the job, pivot to something else once they have those skills. Um, the second thing that comes up a lot in terms of what motivates workers to want to get into something new and want to start a new kind of training or pilot program or something like that is that the workers themselves aren't always comfortable with the kind of volatility and lack of economic stability that goes with having to do that kind of stuff yourself. Mm. And so often really like programs that are specifically designed with employers where the employers not guarantee, but say, you know, if you go through our program and if you meet the curriculum that we've designed specifically to fill this type of role, we'll, you know, you're basically guaranteed to get a job. Or, or like, if you meet the criteria, you're very likely to be hired. It's that kind of thing that will make workers take the economic <coughs> risk of, of getting into a new thing when they otherwise might not have tried to, to get into a new role. Excellent, Jonathan, go ahead. I had something to ask Derek, but go ahead. Yeah, so uh, there's a few things I wanna, you, you touched on so many things that are interesting there, but um, there are some unique training programs uh, where um, companies, uh, you know, will have students pay to take the training, mm -hmm. and then if they get, to do a really good job, succeed in the course, they'll actually hire them and pay them back. So there are some cool new training models uh, but I think overall what I'm seeing in general, which is why I think things are moving to self-directed learning, um, is companies don't care to pay for training anymore, large organizations. They, not only do they not care to pay for training anymore, they, you know, I don't think they in the future want to have people on there as a resource. They want to have their IP, they want to have their customers, and they want to rent people. Right, so I think that they've just stopped. It should be illegal, right? But they've stopped <laughs> focusing on training. So well, just, go ahead, go ahead, Megan. No, I was just going to say, I think that's so interesting, and maybe it's because AT&T has been around for a very long time, but, I mean, we spend $220 million a year in skilling our employees, yeah. right? So, I, so that, I mean, whether or not we're good. effective or not, <laughs> right, and, I mean, is, is another question. But. So I see actually a combination of those two trends, which is that, that companies are identifying more specifically what they want their core functions to be and working on training and retaining workers that go with those specific core functions and then outsourcing the rest of the stuff. And whether that is to freelance workers um, at the low, medium, or high skill level, or they're with workers that are sort of tied to the company in some way, but on a project or rotating basis, those are the trends I that I see right. happening. In fact, the CFI report, I just, when I glanced at it, it also actually talks about it. one of the first things that it calls out is this, this notion of hybrid mm -hmm. um, jobs, which is business and technology. And in, in its case, that's the example it used, and it, it kind of drives at the same point. I did want to very quickly validate, though, that the, the trends that you're picking up there are specifically, are, are they unique to middle skill jobs, or are they generally uh, applicable? And is there anything specific about middle skills jobs 
that might apply to what you what you just expressed. Yeah. Uh, that there are a tough fewer question, of them potentially. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I think I think that the need to be more self-directed and proactive in connecting with the kind of work you want to do is something that workers of all skill levels will need to do. Yeah, James, what, what were you going to say? I, I know. Yeah, I was. It, it, the backdrop of all of this, obviously, is full employment. So in that in that environment, I, although I do agree that there are organizations. So can out you repeat that? I didn't catch that. What the, backdrop the, the is backdrop what? The backdrop of this is is really the full employment full environment employment. we find. Got it. Right? It is. I, when I talk to chief chief human resource officers, they're very interested in investing in people because it's far less expensive to invest in someone than to go hire someone. So it's a build versus buy argument. So there is the appetite, uh, and I think it's gaining a lot of momentum to invest in, in existing employees to either get them career pathways to accelerate their career or transition them to another element of the company or another skill set that they need as the technologies emerge. Because the, the other backdrop is, is that companies are investing in as much um, technology as they can to uh, you know, shorten their expenses on workforce. So there is kind of a push-pull uh, component to this. But I, I see no appetite loss in terms of developing employees from within. And that's a big part of our business is helping you know drive uh, you know low low cost pathways to those types of skills. So, so, so I'll take that point and drive this. You know, you've talked to me a little bit about yeah. this. There are other motivations for enterprises to go after. Yes, learning outcomes, but also uh, ROI and operating leverage, cost efficiency, yeah. stuff like that. Can you then kind of talk yeah, a little so, bit about some of those drivers so, in the enterprise that might? Sure. Might so we'll focus on healthcare a bit. So uh, there's this trend where nurses and nurse practitioners are doing more work uh, that the doctors have typically done. And, and that really creates a big space underneath the nurses in that, that uh, value chain, mm -hmm. where the middle skill um, workers are taking on more and more uh, of the load in these healthcare settings. And their jobs are becoming more and more complex uh, because they're becoming more technology enabled. So uh, analogy that we use uh, when we describe this uh, in our own institution is uh, years ago, medical transcriptionists uh, used to be a very uh, common job. Um, they're disappearing rapidly now due to outsourcing, uh, but primarily technology. Uh, and that was once a rote job. It's just transcribing what the doctor said. And that's being replaced um, in some areas by uh, what's called a medical scribe. And that medical <coughs> scribe is not just taking doctor's notes and putting them into a word processing document. He or she is doing electronic uh, health record entry uh, with complex software systems, uh, doing referrals to other doctors, uh, writing e-prescriptions that are eventually signed by the doctor, doing document management uh, in the healthcare setting. So you think of all that additional work that's being picked up by basically the same type of person that was doing it in the past. So that's where the training really comes into play, where that, that person doing that work needs a, an entirely broader and more diverse skill set than he or she had in the past. And that's where schools like us come into play, uh, or bigger, larger healthcare institutions making those own investments, partnering with folks like Pearson. Uh, what we're seeing, the real challenge is um, uh, in the smaller healthcare settings where they don't have the, the time, the sophistication, or the desire uh, to invest in this training. And that's where we see uh, them falling behind a bit because they're not investing in their middle skills employees. Got it. So I'm, I'm going to flip that on the other side. We talked a little bit about the employers, but the job seekers, and, the, and so Jonathan, just directed you a little bit, and others here can chime in. So this idea of how to help the job seekers recognize that they have to pivot or they need to pivot or they want to pivot. And then B, we talked a little bit about this, how they finish the retraining or reskilling and be able to find ways to present that back to the, the employer or another employer to figure out how they can take advantage of that, uh, that reskilling. So can you talk a little bit about both those? Yeah, so, so there are, I think, three different types of skill assessments that exist out there. So there are skill-based assessments. So think like uh, Hacker Rank, right, where mm -hmm. instead of asking if you know how to code JavaScript, you actually can code, right? So it's assessing yeah. you. Um, and that's a much more effective way to see if someone knows how to do something. Um, there's, and those are used both before, you could use that before you uh, apply to a job to assess whether you have the skills necessary to be successful or you know, as you're applying for a job. 
There are uh, um, behavioral-based assessments. So these are soft skills. And the trend that we've been seeing is game-based behavioral assessments, so like Pymetrics or Arctic Shores, where uh, you could play a video game basically on your computer and, and it will shoot out some behavioral skills, you know, your, how risk averse you are, et cetera. Um, those are, are actually, again, sitting at the top of the funnel. So you could play uh, Pymetrics and actually see jobs that you'd be a good fit for. Um, and then there's simulation-based assessments. These are my favorite. Uh, you actually go through a simulation of what the job would be like. So if it's a call center representative, companies like Interviewed or Gap Jumpers will actually put you through what uh, you'll do on the job and assess you and, and actually tell you if you're a good fit. Um, so, so like I said, these could be used as a, by the candidates to test themselves to see where, what um, jobs they should fit into, but also it's used by the organizations to assess these candidates. Um, once you are able to use these systems to understand your skills more effectively, there are what I call resume builders, where you can pump this information into a tool that will design a really fancy resume, sucking in all the information that's relevant to an employer. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, very good. And then again, uh, just to validate, it sounds like you know these tools, for example, would be applicable to any grade of skills, but would thrive in the middle skill space. Yes. Primarily because again, they address the kind of the imperatives that. Yeah, I think that they, the middle skill um, folks have the hardest time um, articulating what skills yeah. they have, you mentioned and that. so that's why these help um, to help you understand what skills you have more you know better, and and also. Um, the, the organization you're applying to. Excellent. I'll, I have another trends question and then we'll come back to the ecosystem. I, I, I do want to kind of flesh that out a little bit because of the marketplace background that you have, Jonathan. But So automation. Uh, and again, I know I, I'll, I'll start with you again, uh, Kristen, because uh, you've uh, you know, kind of come from that background and you continue to um, kind of work there. So the, we, they would like us to believe, they, I don't know who, but uh, would like us to believe that automation is killing jobs. But, but the reality probably is somewhere in the middle, you know, in the sense that, um, yes, some jobs will be killed, but other jobs will be created. There's augmentation, which means there's reskilling and shifting of uh, skill sets that can happen. Um, so while um, uh, that, that might be a precipitating factor, you know, this augmentation, if you will, is likely to upend how the demand um, for, for these new skills kind of are, are coming through. So, what I'd like to see, maybe, maybe James can start first, and Kristen, you can kind of build on top of that uh, this time. But try. So how would you kind of react to that opinion? And, and, so, and what do you see, especially in the enterprises that you're engaging with, um, in, in understanding the impact of automation uh, or automation-like technologies? It doesn't have to be automation. Um, uh, and, and, and how that might be a driver for reskilling and how do you equip both the employer and the employee of jobs? Yeah, it's absolutely a driver. I mean, there's no question that there's huge segments of the workforce that um, are going to be disintermediated in some way, shape, or form through automation. So, I mean, we're seeing it in transportation, we're seeing it in distribution. Um, there, you know, and, and in customers that we talk to, um, they are. You know, from a macro sense, you can argue that the polluting businesses, jobs lost will be, uh, uh, you know, complemented by green technologies. But at a very micro level within an employer, there's an imperative as they make huge investments in automation and other technologies to kind of streamline their business workflow. They do need to reskill the workforce that then is behind that that has to support it. Mm -hmm. So... Now, not sitting here saying, and, and employers are saying that all employees will be kept and jobs will be found and everything, because there are macro trends here. But, you know, in a lot of the employers we work with, part of the, the number one job, first job, is identify future skills based on business trends. And how do we get ahead of that and take a very concerted effort? And I think that's where you're seeing a lot of momentum more than ever on employers' parts, partly because they and this is not my opinion, that's, this is a collection of my experiences through them, is that the education system isn't necessarily perfectly geared to support this, these types of business imperatives. So they have to take ownership themselves. So it really, taking a very transactional benefit like tuition subsidies, which in some companies are tens of millions of dollars, and exercising them more strategically like what you're doing around 
creating not just pathways, but reskilling opportunities for those who are going to take advantage of it. And it is, a, it is gaining a lot of momentum, and it's very, very popular to talk about and, and execute on. Yep. So. Anything to add, Kristen, before I go to Megan? I have a kind of a spirit of work question for her, but I'd like to see what you want to add to the, the automation space. Uh, yes, in that um, there certainly are studies out there saying that some amount of of jobs we know today will disappear as a result of automation. But I think it's more likely that we'll see more and more kinds of jobs change rather than disappear entirely. Um, the, your example was a great one of the medical transcriptionist and medical transcriptionist. Those people still have the knowledge and skills of working in the medical industry. They've just pivoted to something that's more of a human to human interaction in some way. And they're either assisting with, you know, helping patients process and talk about their you know reactions so that it can be tracked better by the AI or whatever the thing is it, I think we'll see many many more people transitioning to understanding and interpreting the information that is analyzed by by um, machines and automated systems and go from there um, so it's really like Pearson actually has a great report out on how 30 percent of jobs will change potentially as a result of automation, but not disappear as a result of automation. So I think the charge and challenge for all of us is to think about are we creating the kinds of systems that will, that will allow people to know what the opportunities are, access the skills and training that are connected to things that are growing as a result of advanced technologies, and, and sort of giving new opportunities or entrepreneurial opportunities to people who don't fit neatly into those corporate <coughs> categories. So Megan, in this, again, the spirit of talking about automation, particularly technologies that generally disrupt the traditional nature of work, right? We call it the future of work or whatever. <coughs> Can you give us a little bit of a sense, just from a CSR perspective, or just from a community perspective within large em employers, what is the morale, the spirit of people as they watch something like this enter their vernacular. Uh, you know, in a big company like AT&T, I can imagine you can watch that in degrees uh, across the different spectrums. Of, I just want to get a sense of how they might view um, this trend, if you will. Uh, and you're speaking to the community or no, the, yeah, the employees? Yeah. Okay. So, well, I think it's interesting what you mentioned about education because I think ensuring that we are driving the connection between learning and job pathways mm -hmm. is really pivotal to how we're attracting talent. Mm -hmm. And that's why we fund some of the programs that we do in the community to help teachers that are bound by academia and other constraints to just give tests, et cetera, but overlay this idea that the learning that you're getting in schools is ultimately going to lead to a specific career pathway. Mm -hmm. and that can happen in a lot of different ways. But the upskilling and reskilling that happens internally to AT&T right now, which is the bulk of what that 200 million is going towards, is to provide curated in-house hours of trainings that is, an employee can go in on their own time and develop their own personalized learning experience. But then it's also relationships with Georgia Tech and Udacity. So nano degrees and online masters in computer science and data analytics that those employees can also participate in. And so it's really more, to Kristen's point, not that they're going to become obsolete, but they have the opportunity to pivot into something different. And the skilling that they have to take on to get there is not going to be something that's out of reach for them. So I'll just push you on that point for yeah. one second. Yeah. Uh, the previous um, session here, right before mm -hmm. we got on stage, I caught a little bit of it in mm -hmm. the end. One of the points that they were talking about is, you know, you can't, you know, it's, you know, and Kristen, I think you also alluded a little bit, if there's not enough structure for many, of, majority of the employees in the employee base, they can lose their way in trying to figure out self-directed learning, if you will, right? Providing nano degrees in Udacity and Georgia Tech or whatever, in terms of upskilling and reskilling, if you just do that. So can you give us a sense on what else the employer might be doing or should be doing even. Uh, you, can, you can push it in giving that structure a little bit sure. more direction. And, and that was the word I think the, the panel used is direction uh, into to that self-directed learning exercise. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of leveraging internal existing 
functionality like employee resource groups, which are very large at AT&T, mm -hmm. and leveraging a women of AT&T and having them come up with this shift program that takes place on an annual basis where everyone is participating in a transformational learning series together mm -hmm. with some of their peers. Uh, so, so that's one way. And I also think that on the attraction side, as we're bringing young people in, it's through development programs. You know, it started with a flagship leadership development program that was for all the MBAs, right? But now we have a technology, we have a cybersecurity, we have a retail sales, we have all these other development programs that those that we're using for a pipeline in. So we're managing what's happening it right now inside, but then we're also figuring out how to maybe mitigate some of that on the front end as well. James, you know, you, yeah, really quickly. Yeah, you know, and then Derek. I mean, yeah. one of the one of the things we're experiencing in, in, in companies who are really taking an aggressive approach here is is kind of revisiting and reinvigorating the whole notion of making career pathways extremely transparent, mm -hmm. making the 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 credentials and or skills that you need to move down that line very transparent, very articulated and aware. But then the backdrop of that is. Is there an infrastructure in place to satisfy the demand of those who now understand what I need exactly to do to get to that next job or the skip level job? And there's a lot of momentum around you know, creating a structure and a framework to articulate that. Because if you're right, on a morale side, from an employee, if you don't know what that next step is and you don't know how to get there, life can be fairly bleak if you, you, if you, if you want to get ahead. The, the next easiest thing might be able to do is to go get a job somewhere else. So any investment along those lines is really a hedge strategy against recruitment and retention. So we're seeing a lot of focus in clients that we work with on revisiting that entire concept, but really putting some you know, wood behind the arrow to make it happen. Sounds good. Derek, you want to Yeah, say? I definitely echo uh, the point on the career path, and we embed all that in our curriculum. And, uh, and then just maybe a, a slightly different point on on building confidence. And again, we focus on, on low skill to middle skill in our setting. And, and we find that uh, many of our students may not have had the best mentoring, uh, the best high school experience, the best role modeling. So we feel like we really need to provide that uh, for our students. And, and we invest a lot of time and energy and, and resources on, on building that confidence and motivating the students and just making sure uh, they believe they can take that next step. They're certainly intellectually capable of it but many have uh, self-doubts uh, based on their life experiences. And, and I think this is critical. Um, you know, those of us in the, the high skill world, we're always ready to take on a new challenge and, and, and climb that next mountain. You know, if, if you're used to a job, you've been in it for years, you're comfortable, even if it isn't the best job, even if it isn't the job you're most excited about, even if it doesn't pay that well, mm -hmm. you may have all sorts of fear uh, to move on. Uh, to something that'll put you in a better uh, situation in life. And that's such a big part, I think, of society helping move folks from that low to middle, middle skill, skill level. Yep. Kristen? Uh, serendipitously, my comment connects both Derek and James's comments, which is that we haven't talked at all today about any types of pathways of jobs that aren't connected to an existing employer, a corporate employer. And 20 to 30 percent of workers in America today, right now, get at least some portion of their income from a non-traditional source. And so I think we need to really think carefully about the kinds of coaching and mentorship and visible pathways and confidence building for people who want to go into either lifestyle, that sort of category of jobs that is human to human enhancing, like fitness or foodie stuff, um, travel and tourism, uh, craft, building things, um, things that are care-based, those things, and the freelance world where people are sort of being independent <coughs> entrepreneurs of one and figuring out what those pathways look like and how to convey that to people, build people's confidence, sort of think through the, the sort of non traditional approaches to entrepreneurial training is another thing that that gets lost in the discussion I think of when we're when we conceptualize all of work as exactly how it is today and you know the beauty of that is that's almost completely non-traditional learning that applies okay. in those areas almost completely I mean there's some certification here and there with you know, those jobs that you just talked about they're all very 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 non-traditional um, so I'm going to pivot back to uh, kind, of a, kind of a marketplace question, um, 
around skills, right? So, so Jonathan, um, um, so just an example that came to me is Markle Foundation. They have a program called Skillful. Um, and I, Megan, I imagine you also probably know a little bit about this, but um, uh, and they have partnered with Microsoft in this case, I think, to uh, create kind of an ecosystem of skills-based marketplace, you know, understanding employers, employees' needs, and Microsoft, because they're embedded in a good chunk of these enterprises in terms of technology, are able to recognize those needs and be able to translate that quickly back to the Skillful program. Can you speak a little bit to this, this idea, and, the, and the, the, just expand the idea of the, the need for such an ecosystem? And I know you, I can, you can apply it from the talent acquisition side to more of the kind of the skill side, but just the understanding of why an ecosystem works, what are the incentives provided to the people playing it, typically in an ecosystem or a marketplace, how does that typically work, and why would something like this be very successful in the middle school, middle what, skill when you, What do you mean when you say ecosystem? Uh, the marketplace. You know, you have different players. You you are, you have folks who are who can train. You have folks who can recognize the skill needs. You have, you have folks who can understand when employees are looking to pivot or needing to pivot or wanting to pivot. Sure. Like so that, right? first of all, even within one company. So if you look at Hilton, for example, and you look at two bartender jobs at Hilton, yeah. uh, they're named different things, right? So that's just within one company. Now, when you look at two different companies, there are two roles that require the same skill set name different things. So just getting the companies around the table and talking about aligning around a taxonomy of skills that could you know, be translated across different companies, different industries, it would be a, a start. Then you know, obviously layering on the training you know, schools and the other parts of the ecosystem will you know, make that ecosystem even more vibrant. But I mean, we have a ways to go with just this skills taxonomy. Yes. That's an interesting comment. I mean, I heard some interesting stories with some clients that we had talked about in, in the retail and restaurant space where they're within a given geographic, uh, you know, ecosystem, if you will. They're working with competitors and other employers to create job sharing. Hmm. So if you are a waiter at a given restaurant, but you are part-time, can you then go to a potential competitor and fill your vacant time with them and can they, it, it speaks to this transferable skills and, and some uniform definition of jobs, but you know, it's getting to that point. That's how short some of these you know, lower end middle skills positions are. And frankly, it may even you know, uh, transfer up. So it's some interesting stuff that companies are trying to solve you know, in the Dallas area alone. It's, it's kind of interesting. Wow. We, uh, I've seen some really interesting technology around just that. I mean, right, yeah. Basically like scheduling tools that like all, imagine all the companies in the mall using the same scheduling tool, and then you can get certified to, to work at different companies. So theoretically, you can work yeah. at four different companies, mm -hmm. and you just go in like Uber, say the times you're available to work, and you could f find the shifts that you want to work in. It could be a cashier because you're certified as a cashier at one company. It could be as a, you know, I don't know all the roles within a, a retail yeah. establishment, <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and what that also does is it's making it, um, you're, as a job seeker, um, your life um, better because before you had to rely on your manager to make your hours, and now you can make your hours. Yeah, and That's it right. goes to the point that Kristen also pointed about economic security, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, you suddenly have a lot more control that basically says, I can do all these different things, and I am plotting what, what the definition of the, or the threshold of my economic security is, right? Yeah, so I've seen that. I've seen companies that do that in the, um, in the retail and restaurant space, and then I've seen companies that do it in the um, warehouse and manufacturing space. Um, I haven't seen anybody combine it into one thing, um, which I, I think probably would allow for workers to have set have more control over their schedules, have sort of a backstop of economic security that they they knew if they wanted to earn X amount of income, yeah. they would do it. But what I am observing, though, is, and this is slightly outside the scope of our the topic of our discussion, but for something like this to actually really work at scale, the other additional things that go with that will have to also be reimagined. Mm -hmm. Benefits, as an example. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, so in this case, how do you construct mm -hmm. or reconstruct benefits to align with this? Obviously, that's not part of our discussion, but I just want to highlight. That's for the highlight. blockchain conversation. That's right, <laughs> the blockchain conversation. That's right. <laughs> Excellent. Anything else to add, Derek? Well, I was just going to say uh, there's a practical application of what you're saying in our 
environment. Uh, in medical billing and coding, one of our programs, for instance, uh, we teach um, <coughs> what we think is a, a very widely available uh, EMR system, <coughs> electronic medical records, but it's not used by everybody. It's a fragmented industry uh, still. And so we have uh, after graduation modules uh, where we teach specific EMR systems for the employers who, who just insist on having that instead of having to train somebody themselves. So they, they pushed it back to us. You know, we accept the, the challenge and have set up those additional modules. And it's just that, uh, that example of really tailoring uh, the uh, work experience for that employer. Yep. So, like you're we have exactly a minute left, so I'm going to use that to kind of help us wrap this so you can just quickly go through. Um, so obviously, we are helping, especially through the middle skills jobs lens, shifting the paradigm of how the future of work looks like, you know, based on what we discussed. Can you um, say how middle skills enable individuals to personalize how they assemble their work? And I think we touched a little bit on this previous answer, uh, but I want to be able to correlate that to the economic stability and security of the, that individual as well. You can use that question to wrap up or add any point that you want to, that you think we didn't discuss today at all on the, on the topic. Derek, you want to go first? Yeah, in, in terms of that uh, personalization, I, I think you know, what we see in, in our setting is folks coming back to us, uh, sometimes years after they leave, to get that additional training. Uh, we leave our learning management system, our LMS, open indefinitely for students to come back and get uh, retraining on topics that are very important uh, in their field. Uh, we have an alumni team that helps students uh, get uh, not just the first job, but the second job. So it's that constant support and that building of confidence that, that we find so important uh, in the middle skills arena. Megan, go ahead. I was just going to say from a funder perspective and within the K-12 education, education space, I think it's uh, really working with schools, working with the nonprofits, working with all these different partners that we um, overlay programs with to help them understand that link between learning skills, job, and then it could be a variety of jobs. I mean, that's what's going to get young people that don't see the futures, especially the opportunity youth, excited is when they hear, oh, I can have six different jobs if I get this one credential. James? No, I think that's right. Um, you know, I see middle skills in this arena as just an on-ramp for most people. Um, you know, they, they may have had some lack of success in other endeavors that they've tried, but now they're, they've set their sights on a career. And to the extent we can help them connect the dots on that career and then allow them to create and allow them to pursue their personal path, I think is, is, is what this is all about, so. Quickly, Jonathan and Kristen, you're gonna split I do already over time, but go ahead. You can go first. So briefest possible way is we just need to stop talking about it in terms of finding a job and start talking about it as helping people connect with work or create the kind of work they want to do. Yeah, uh, just sum up that what, basically what everyone said. Skills needed for jobs, for middle school jobs are going to change significantly. Uh, it's it cheaper to, uh, to, in, to retrain than to hire from the, the ground up. You all should be training. I can't believe that, that uh, companies no longer uh, want to train, and uh, we have an exciting future ahead. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry you're on time, but appreciate it.